The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Please help me welcome Dr. Shule Nixad from JPL. Shule. Thank you, Michelle. Good morning. Um, I'm just going to briefly tell you about the short course. We have uh, a very uh, fun uh, group together because uh, we're going to have Paul Scohan from ASU tell us about an um, overview of what we can learn in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. Then we switch to technology, and uh, we've taken one aspect of it. What are the most uh, challenging aspects of detection in ultraviolet? And then uh, we switch gears again, and we talk about future and whether the hot field of nanotechnology can help us um, detect in ultraviolet and do things that we haven't been able to do yet. So I'm going to keep it brief, and I want to introduce Professor Paul Scohan of the Hubble's pillar of, uh, Pillars of Creation fame, <laughs> who will tell us all about ultraviolet science. Let's give a big welcome. <laughs> so when we look at the current capabilities that we have, um, Galax, of course, is pretty much the ultraviolet imager that we use um, up in space. And some quick overviews of what that capability looks like. It costs $100 million. Um, it is an explorer, um, which means it is limited in size and stuff, but um, it has done excellent work um, within those boundaries and uh, has produced remarkable survey data across two UV bands. Um, the other capability spectroscopically that we have, of course, is uh, COS on Hubble. Um, which the instrument cost 88 million. Um, it's on a much larger telescope because it's an instrument um, and offers two UV channels um, for a variety of different capabilities. So looking at Galax first, um, the optical system is described here in relatively straightforward fashion. We have two pass bands, the far ultraviolet and the near ultraviolet. Um, the technology involved here um, addresses issues such as coatings and the use of a variety of different filters and grisms to image um, the pass bands onto a 75 um, millimeter uh, MCP down on the back plane. Um, it has been remarkably successful in a lot of the different survey science that has come out of it. Um, and I think this is testament to the promise of the ultraviolet band in terms of what we can still do as we look to the future. Um, the kinds of uh, parameters that we look at in terms of what is, cap what is up there right now, there's a whole slew of different numbers in here, but you start to uh, have to appreciate the kinds of coatings issues in terms of being able to reflect your light um, with uh, a minimum of losses. Um, in the ultraviolet, you're all about the number of reflections that you have in your optical system. And so you have to try and minimize the numbers of those. You have to worry about the uh, different um, transmissive windows or reflective um, surfaces that you use and the, the, the depth to which you uh, wish to uh, achieve your science. Um, all becomes a, a critical factor when you're, when you're putting together an instrument of this kind. And Galax was very good in that regard. The kind of science that has been cap and this is by no means going to be a, a thorough summary of what Galax has been able to achieve, but the kinds of things that have been able to come out of this um, is uh, really important uh, all sky surveys in a wavelength space that really wasn't um, available up to that point uh, because of course from the ultraviolet we uh, have a problem here on the ground of, of seeing what's going on out there um, in those pass bands. And so this is uh, a pictorial representation of the All Sky Survey that came out of the Explorer program. Um, it has provided capability to do uh, surveys of the nearby Magellanic Clouds in the, exactly the same manner. Um, there is a brightness limitation on what we can do 
uh, with some aspects of it. One of the things that uh, Galax gives you, uh, the, uh, the ability to go to in, the, in the ultraviolet to add to the uh, optical passbands that we're used to using for studying star formation, stellar populations, things of that kind, by adding those two extra bands in the ultraviolet, it gives us a lot more leverage over um, looking at spectral energy distributions to synthesize the stellar populations in the underlying um, galactic structure and this gives us um, a lot more a lot better feel for the star formation history the star formation efficiency um, the kinds of modes in the star formation world that we really wish to understand uh, looking for variations in the initial mass function all of those kinds of things and so ultraviolet really gives us some leverage that um, you just can't get in the optical or even the infrared. There's, there's a lot of sensitivity there on the very blue end of the uh, spectral energy distributions from a lot of the stellar populations we wish to uh, address. So an example of this is how you can combine the data for a particular galaxy together um, with longer passbands with things like the optical or the infrared. And then when you start to study parts of the uh, spiral distribution of stars and the stellar populations in a galaxy of this kind, you start to be able to look at um, what the infrared e excess is between the infrared and the ultraviolet. This gives you some feel for the reddening, for the uh, relative strength of the luminosity coming out in the different passbands, and this gives you a direct feel for the age distribution of uh, stars and the underlying material that feeds the formation of those stars relative to where the spiral shock is and ultimately um, when the gas, the, the gas gets assembled into stars and ultimately when that produces dust and uh, that dust is evacuated out from the regions of new, new star formation. So there is a real advantage, a real leverage that you can gain over the business of understanding star formation and the progression and evolution of galactic populations and even structure from going to the ultraviolet and combining it with the optical and the infrared. Uh, similarly, uh, one of the uh, parts of this business that is of course quite in vogue right now is understanding how Lyme and Brake galaxies um, work, what, what do they mean, what do they represent, what part of the galactic evolution story are we looking at? And of course, we, we suffer from, even with HST, a lack of resolution um, at uh, the peak of the galactic evolution star formation history around a Z of two or three. Um, and so what you'd like to be able to do is use um, near field cosmology to be able to look at nearby galaxies that have very similar properties to understand spatially what is going on within those galaxies that you could never achieve at the uh, higher redshifts that we're talking about. And so in this regard, um, this particular example here allows us to use the full complement of uh, ultraviolet capability that we have right now to use the galaxy images um, that uh, come out of uh, things like the legacy survey and combine it with spectra that we obtain with cost to really identify um, galaxies that morphologically appear to be very similar to Lyman break galaxies that we see at intermediate redshifts but also to uh, make sure that the spectral signatures of those galaxies looks very similar as well, that you see the same um, very strong Lyman alpha emission, uh, the same structure um, spectrally as well as spatially that um, allow you therefore to maybe have a better feel for what um, the uh, environment is like, what the uh, spatial and evolutionary tracks of those galaxies might look like. Another aspect um, when you're trying to understand uh, what the evolution of the star formation environment looks like um, is to look for signatures such as H2 fluorescence, um, which has a, a variety of different signatures there in the far ultraviolet. And this gives you a very unique insight um, that you do not have available any, at any other passband. And for instance, uh, an AGB star like CW Leo um, looks relatively innocuous in the, uh, in the POS plates here, but as soon as you start getting into uh, the near and far ultraviolet, you can start to see 
dust scattering in the environment around it, as well as fluorescence of the molecular hydrogen around it, uh, giving you some feel for the connection between that AGB star and the assembly of molecular material around it. Um, and this particular object um, is an interesting example in that it uh, produces maybe the first example of uh, a so-called astrosphere, uh, where you can see direct interaction between the uh, star and its, uh, its environment that it is influencing and how that interface interfaces with the local interstellar medium, the interstellar wind, and uh, the return of that material, the, maybe the uh, molecular material and, and the dust that's produced around it back into the ISM um, to complete the ecological cycle that we wish to trace when we're trying to understand the uh, star formation cycle. Um, and so what you're looking at when you look for these, I mean, this, this is a quite a remarkable picture here that, uh, that shows the kind of environments and directly you see the, the passage of material from one phase to the other. And I think this is, this is a real strength of, of the approach and of the passband. So that's uh, what we've been able to do. It's just a smattering of the kind of thing we've been able to do in the imaging world with Galax. Um, HST COS, uh, we're all familiar with, um, is a remarkable spectrograph that was installed uh, in SM4 on HST. Um, it has a variety of different modes. Um, it has, from the choice of the uh, gratings that was used, it has really maximized the throughput of the telescope in the ultraviolet passbands. And this uh, diagram indicates just how well it does compared to what we've been used to being able to do with STIS in its E140 mode. Um, so it really is a remarkable instrument and allows us uh, um, unprecedented access to uh, spectral components in the ultraviolet. Um, they did this, of course, by eliminating most of the transmissive optics, um, using INH holographic gratings, a big detector um, with an opaque photocathode so that everything got detected rather than some of it passing through it. And it delivers two channels at ve very remarkable resolution, ours of typically 20,000, 20, and a pretty decent limiting sensitivity because of the fact it's behind a 2.4 meter telescope. Uh, the kind of science that's been possible with, uh, with COS, and again, this is a, a smattering of it. There's a lot of uh, attention, of course, on the intergalactic medium. The ultraviolet provides us a direct uh, measure of uh, a lot of what's going on in that important interface between the galactic environment where we understand and, and, and are familiar with the stars that are formed, um, and we are used to looking in the optical, but also it... it you want to have a much better feel for how material is passed backwards and forwards between the intergalactic medium and, uh, and those uh, galactic environments. And so when you're looking at the IGM, you've got to realize that you're looking at an awfully large amount of the baryonic matter in the universe. Um, and it's a variety of different uh, temperature phases in much the same way that we're used to uh, different temperature phases in the ISM. And there's a, a variety of different diagnostics that we can use to attack those problems, to understand where the material is, um, the density of it, the distribution of it, the energetics of it. And that's where uh, we, the ultraviolet is really the only game in town when it comes to this kind of thing, because it, it has the, uh, the brightness necessary and uh, the relatively low background to be able to go after these, uh, these particular species. And there's a variety of different species there in the last bullet that you can go after that really gives you some feel for the structure that you see in those media, but also to look for broad, for instance, H1 Lyman alpha absorption that gives you some feel for the structure of the interface. And this is an example of a broad Lyman alpha absorption feature that uh, Blair Savage found and uh, has published quite extensively on using cost data. Um, Another area that is quite the flavor du jour, of course, is uh, understanding the epochs of reionization in the universe cosmologically. Um, we're used to the argument of going after um, ionized hydrogen, and this, is, of course, is much more of a, an optical to near-infrared discussion, um, but there are also uh, helium um, reionization eras as well that uh, fall diagnostically much more into the uh, ultraviolet, and that's where...
uh, work such as uh, what Shell has been able to do, um, look for troughs of strong absorption in the emission. Um, and this gives you, uh, and this is at a much different uh, redshift epoch. This is at a, a Z of about 2.8, plus or minus a bit. You'll see ver a variety of different troughs and structure around that redshift. Um, so it represents a, a different phase of the reionization of the universe, an area that's really not commonly uh, discussed, but um, it is equally germane to the issue of understanding how the, uh, the, galaxy, the universe as a whole has evolved um, since uh, passing through the era of reionization. And this is an example of the kinds of cost data that Shell has been able to, uh, to observe showing those helium troughs and showing the range of uh, redshifts where these things show up. So it's not a simple matter of just boom, okay, the, the, the switch went off and that's when it all happened. There is a progression um, in redshift where these things started to happen that it wasn't a somewhat uh, progressive uh, process when it happened. In star forming regions, we of course um, are very used to the idea of using Lyman alpha emission to trace the star formation rates. Um, it's a natural enough consequence because the ionization from young stars leads to hydrogen recombination in the ISM. Um, there are complications that come from this because of resonance scattering um, and destruction by dust and a variety of other different things such as interstellar medium dynamics that can trap the photons. Um, there's a variety of different uh, approaches you can take here. One is to use an observational survey of selected Lyman alpha galaxies that can hopefully disentangle some of these effects by varying some of the important parameters. Um, and for an, an, an example that I'm presenting here today is work done by Klaus Lethra and also uh, uh, Dr. French here today, um, that uh, you can, if you select your star forming galaxies correctly, you can bracket abundance effects, dust effects, and luminosity effects to uh, see what the variety of different star forming uh, environments are. And this is uh, an example of um, rest frame spectra of one particular hydrogen alpha um, selected galaxy where you can disentangle the foreground components and look at the, uh, the components that are, that are intrinsic to the galaxy itself and, and give some, uh, some feel for uh, the emission and absorption features that are coming from that galaxy in particular. So looking to the future, that, that, that's the sort of state of play of where things are right now, where, what we've been able to do over the last few years because of the remarkable capabilities that we do have in orbit right now. Um, but as we look to the future, um, some of the things that we would like to try and improve upon are things such as the collecting area that we have available in the ultraviolet. Um, I've been involved in several mission concepts over the last few years um, that are looking at the combination of the ultraviolet with the optical and the near infrared in a variety of different modes, um, maybe behind something like a four meter. Um, you see discussion in the various game plans, if there's enough money, um, to do things like UV optical approaches. And a four meter mirror appears to be um, the kind of uh, quantum leap that is necessary to achieve some of, of the targets and the goals that we're talking about. So the game plan here is, is not to treat ultraviolet as its own uh, isolated passband, but to use it in combination with the optical and the infrared um, to use the larger field of view and the better resolution, and of course the better throughput if you use the right coatings, to allow access to information about star and planet formation as a global process, both in the galactic and near galactic environment. Um, in a variety of different ways. And a lot of the stuff I'm going to be talking about here is work that's come out of uh, collaborations and design work with a whole cast of uh, different folks there on the screen. So star formation, um, when you combine the ultraviolet with the optical and near infrared, it is possible, therefore, to use a diffraction-limited optical system um, at two to 300 nanometers to look at astrometry, photometry, to look at uh, stellar populations all the way from the mid-ultraviolet to the near-infrared, um, to look for, to look along lines of sight to different galactic star-forming regions, to um, look at ver for variations of the initial mass function, um, to look for time variation in the emission that you see in the environments around stellar populations, to um, 
open the doors to a comprehensive imaging survey where you really aren't uh, dictated by the selection criteria that you've used, that you've tried to open up the uh, survey, the size of the data set, to as few selection effects as possible, um, to look for the evolution of circumstellar protoplanetary disks, uh, and uh, to, to bracket the range of environments that star formation can, can happen in. Um, there's a variety of different things that you can get out of this, but it is, at the root of it, it is the application of the range of wavelengths um, that really gives you the leverage over this problem. Um, this can be extended to the Magellanic Clouds in the same manner if you have enough aperture and enough resolution to do this. Um, to, to study the stellar populations there. Um, the kind of survey that you could do in the UV optical in the Magellanic Clouds will go down to a variety of different uh, magnitude limits and uh, narrowband surface brightness limits, but gain, gains you access to stellar populations and lines of sight to OB stars and things like that that you just never could do before. And this really expands the metallicity part of the equation where you really want to understand the uh, nature of um, how the process varies when you're in a metal poor environment uh, and it really gives you some kind of feel for where things could go. Um, this can go further to nearby galaxies but even with a four meter mirror you start to run into resolution issues and uh, you would like to be able to survey the, uh, the hundred nearest galaxies but also to extend that out to maybe a sample of 500 galaxies with a, a, a less deep but uh, more comprehensive filter set um, to study the range of uh, stellar populations, the uh, star formation environments, because it, it's a matter of how many different data points you have to put on the diagram. In our own galactic environment, there's a range of things you can look at, but it's not as, a, um, as wide as it probably could be. And so you need to extend to nearby galaxy populations to really look um, at a larger range of that, those, those parameters to understand what the uh, range of star formation could be. Um, but it's not limited to just stellar populations. Um, that, that was more of the imaging angle of things. Far ultraviolet spectroscopy with a four meter class aperture really does open uh, new vistas. Um, there's a variety of different diagnostics that you can use for young stellar environments, uh, protoplanetary environments where um, you can use the strong ultraviolet lines to trace material as it is uh, accreting in and falling onto the stellar surface of a, a young stellar object. Um, there are absorption spectrum fluorescent emission that you can use to measure the, uh, the density and existence and location of molecular hydrogen and therefore to look at the critical factor of the disk gas mass in protoplanetary systems because this is a, an open issue right now about how you assemble uh, the gaseous material to produce the large gaseous planets that are of course being detected quite easily these days in protoplanetary or uh, around nearby stars. Um, but there's a, a whole series of diagnostics there that really can only be done in the far ultraviolet. There's a limit to what you can do in the optical and near infrared. Of course, we're also familiar with transit spectroscopy right now. And in the far ultraviolet, there are, really are a series of excellent, um, very strong absorption lines that allow us to probe the atmospheric components of things like hot Jupiters to um, put boundary conditions on interior structure models and to look at the evaporation rates because some of these planets are extremely close into their ionizing sources and uh, ionization and evaporation is going to be a very considerable factor. We may just be catching these things before they boil away. So that in this particular field, field far ultraviolet spectroscopy is really quite invaluable. Um, in the same way, bipolar outflows, uh, this is a very common footprint of uh, the star formation environment. We see the majority of uh, systems that are accreting material produce a bipolar outflow. We can use near ultraviolet lines such as magnesium 2 uh, to look at very high spatial and velocity resolutions to, to look at the dynamics to see bursts in the outflow that uh, can correspond to uh, non-uniform or, or episodic accretion in the, uh, the passage of material from the so circumstellar disk into the actual star itself. 
and this can be used to diagnose things such as the, the launch mechanisms. There's a lot of discussion about how that actually works when you dump material onto a central star, how do you actually kick stuff out along the axes. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot of uh, information that can be gotten out of there. Um, things like, uh, of course, the flow of material, but also the, how quickly things are rotating down there in the center. The kinds of resolutions that are necessary in objects in the Taurus uh, cloud is things like tens of AU, which is something like 0.07 arc seconds, um, and spectral resolutions above 10,000, so of course, with the low backgrounds. But that drives you again in the direction of having a very, um, a much larger mirror than we've been able to do in the past in the ultraviolet. And so th this is another of the uh, scientific drivers for a four meter class type of, uh, type of mission. Another aspect of this that uh, is really actually quite interesting, and I hadn't thought about this too much until it was called to my attention, was the ability um, in the near Earth environment to actually use the ultraviolet to uh, study better the different classes of um, asteroid and uh, moon-like objects within our own solar system. Um, a lot of the material on the surface of these bodies um, actually becomes quite strongly absorbing in the ultraviolet and it gives you some real leverage over the classifications of these objects. Um, for instance, on the moon, you can use these techniques to look at the distribution of titanium oxide, of all things. Um, but on minor bodies, we can use it to, uh, to really modify and clarify the taxonomic cl classifications that we use for asteroids um, because there's an awful lot of information that comes uh, from these different mineral identifications that the ultraviolet gives you access to um, that really affects uh, models for how material was deposited on the surfaces, how it has changed when it's been on the surfaces, as well as looking at uh, detection of metals and other uh, elements that are of interest to um, formation models for the structure of these objects in the first place. As I mentioned a little uh, briefly a, a little minute ago, um, you can look in the ultraviolet at star formation in metal poor environments. For instance, if you look in the Magellanic Clouds and execute a, a survey of hundreds of different sight lines towards OB stars, you can use a whole series of different uh, key diagnostics that give you uh, very quantitative access to temperatures, densities, compositions, and kinematics of the gas within these objects. Um, and of course, by extension, direct um, measurement of a lot of the properties of the OB stars themselves. Um, OB stellar atmospheres continue to be um, an issue of modeling. Um, we are a lot better off than we were 10 years ago, but it's still an awful lot of the, uh, the atmosphere models for OB stars um, have issues with regards to opacity and uh, dynamics concerning how well the uh, strong ultraviolet radiation affects the stellar winds that come off of them, and ultimately that affects uh, the contribution of the, to the ultraviolet budget that comes out of new star forming regions as well as the uh, effect of those winds and ultraviolet radiation on the uh, ability of those stars to shape the environment around them to ablate the nearby molecular clouds, to affect the uh, mass function for the secondary stars that come out of the environment around a cluster um, so these kinds of information, these kinds of data, are actually quite critical to understanding really how that process works as a system. And so by going to the Magellanic Clouds, uh, we, we do have the opportunity to uh, move into a low metallicity environment and, and understand just across the suite of different stellar populations within those uh, clouds how, how big the, uh, the differences can be just from... Uh, changes in metallicity. Um, and this, this particular one, th this has come a long way since we started doing considerations of this. The, the interface between our own galaxy and the intergalactic medium, as some of the slides that, I, that I'd uh, stolen from Chris um, at, were testament to, there is a very dynamic ecology that we already understand concerning 
uh, the return of metals and energy through supernova driven outflows and merger debris and tidal interactions. So there, there's material that's returned to the IGM, the IGM re, re uh, back onto the galaxies. So the understanding of that interface is very critical to the kinds of models that we might like to try and understand concerning the formation of stars and uh, the, the progression of star formation across a, uh, an entire galaxy. There's a, a whole series of signatures and a lot of those spectroscopic uh, diagnostics are in the far ultraviolet and that allows us to split the different phases. Remember I, I mentioned those earlier, um, the different phases of the IGM and allows us to look at them as, as separate phases of the media. So I've really rattled through this awfully quickly, but I've actually finished early, which is surprising as all get out, given that I had that so many slides. So I will leave it there and leave it open for questions at this point. Thank you.